Hello, listeners. This is Kat, and welcome back to Put Your Hands Up Podfix. This will be the continuation of When Realities Collide. This will be Part 9, Chapter 9. Shota doesn't think much about where he's going with the kid. They manage to leave campus with little hassle, the gates opening easily when Shota scans his staff ID. He ushers the kid out, and Midori moves quickly, trusting Shota to follow, while also managing to keep close to Shota. There is an odd pressure in his chest at the thought of how the kid is hesitant to put too much distance between them. Yagi can be terrifying when he wants to be. He wasn't the number one hero for numerous years by luck. So, he can't blame the kid. And honestly, it eases his mind a bit to have the student within sight after that debacle. Shota's still angry. He's angry that Midori wasn't safe in the school, even though he should have been. And he's angry that Yagi had tried to attack the kid in the first place. He's angry he wasn't there for Midori when he should have been and he's angry that Tsukuji and Nezu had suspected this might have happened and let it happen anyways. They'd known, since that very first day, that Yagi might have an ill reaction to Midoriya, and they'd still decided to forego even warning the number one hero that the kid wasn't a threat to anyone within the school walls. He doesn't know why. The principal and detective were so insistent that Yagi not know about Midori's presence at the school, but he's angry it had led to this. That a student ended up being attacked within their school that a temporary student had been terrified and feared for his life, right under Shota's nose, that Nezu and Tsukuji had considered this happening a likely possibility from the very start, and still chose the low road when it came to Midoriya's safety. Shota's not sure he's ever been so pissed off with his boss. The thing is, Yagi may be a limelight meathead at times, but he's still a sensible man, he's reasonable. They could have convinced Yagi that Midoriya wasn't Deku, that he's just an innocent heroic student who unfortunately wound up in their reality, and that he wasn't the threat that had fed villains confidential, career-damaging intel. He knows, logically, Yagi can't be blamed completely for this. Unlike the teachers when Midoriya had been introduced to them, Yagi didn't have someone vouching for Midoriya's innocence. He'd heard and acted on the spot, probably didn't even take a second to think before acting. Shota would bet Togata had accidentally let slip. It's not like they told the student body to keep quiet about it, exposing the fact that there is a secret just makes it easier for said secret to get out. The warning had come to just the 1A students and the staff. Togata wouldn't have known. And really, it was brutish and uncalled for, probably terrifying for Midori, considering the definite hero worship the kid has. But it was also a very hero, human reaction to finding out someone who you know is a threat is in what's deemed a safe space. They'd all be a bit brash if they suspected Deku was in the school, if he was with the students unknown. He really didn't know better, and they all know that initial reaction of help and protect is what makes heroes heroes, but that doesn't excuse the blatant dismissal of another pro-hero and a whole class of first-year students vouching for the kid. Like when Shota had first introduced Midoriya to the staff, and despite his presence, his word, they'd still turned on Midoriya right before his eyes. There was no excusing that. Yagi didn't have that initially, but he should have at least given pause when Hisashi defended the kid. He should have considered what was being said. Ignoring your co-workers, fellow heroes, goes against everything they're trying to teach these students. Heroics is not a solo career, no matter how easy All Might made it look over the years. You will be working with other heroes. You may even work with heroes you don't like, but there's still that level of professional trust in the career. If there's no trust in the field, things can go south very fast. There is a reason Shota does so many team activities with his students, mixing and matching skill levels and vastly incompatible quirks, and to know that the example All Might was setting for them, even unintentionally in the heat of the moment, was to act first and ignore everyone else, teammates included, it fills him with a burning rage. If they walk into the world of heroics with that attitude, they're as good as dead. It doesn't matter what course of heroics they choose, limelight, underground, rescue, they're all team efforts when push comes to shove. They're not All Might, and his means won't help your average hero. He should have stopped and considered why Hisashi and Shota's class were fighting back for Midoriya's sake. They're good kids. They have good reasons for what they do, even if they're idiots at times. Yagi knows the students, teaches the foundational hero studies some afternoons. He should have acknowledged them as heroes in training. He knows, the more he turns everything over in his head, that Yagi isn't entirely to blame, but that doesn't mean he can't be pissed off at the situation itself, that he can't be pissed off with Nezu and Tsukuji and All Might and even himself. It's a shitty situation all around, and they're supposed to be the good guys. After everything they'd done to the poor kid, meaning to or not, Shota can't help but feel like a pretty shitty hero. Shota's thoughts swing back to the conversation he had with Tsukuji just minutes before Ida had burst into the conference room. All Might was tied to this somehow, 
deeper than Shota thought. Midoriya, Yagi, Nezu, Tsuguji, and even Togata were all linked together, and he has no idea why. He doesn't understand the secrecy. He doesn't understand the hesitance. He doesn't understand what role Yagi plays in all this. His mentor role to do very different students in two different realities. He was missing something still. This ran deeper than he thought, and now there's two students and more people involved, too. Shota brushes off the thought for now, following along just a step behind Midoriya. They arrive at the train station after a while of walking. He's not used to public transportation as much anymore, not since he and Izashi got their car, and started working at the school where Nezu had company cars on hand should they need it. Not to mention how the dorms have made it so they rarely need to leave campus unless they're doing hero work, and even then, he's faster on rooftops and traversing through the forest surrounding the school than he is a car. He's reminded how much he hates public transportation as he pays the fee for himself after Midoriya scans his student ID without a thought, like it's second nature. He only seems to realize what he'd done when he's granted access through the gate, staring down at his own ID card suspiciously. It miraculously works here, despite being from another reality entirely. Public transportation security must not be as fastidious as UA's security system. Shota follows the boy onto the train silently, trying to ignore the calm way Midoriya guides. There's just something that doesn't sit about how quiet and reserved the kid is being. Midoriya hadn't been overly talkative, not since Shota met him, at least, but this was another level entirely. A thoughtfulness that worried Shota. Still, the man keeps quiet. Midoriya seems to know what he's doing. The ride is practiced and familiar to him. Another instance of their realities being so similar that Midoriya falls into routine. They pass a couple stops, and still the kid doesn't say anything. He stares out the window, expression thoughtful, but eyes almost thoughtless. His hands are laced together in his lap, squeezing so tight that Shota fears he might cut off his own circulation. Worry churns in Shota's stomach. Had they broken the kid? Was All Might that tipping point in Midoriya's little world? It was probably terrifying. Midoriya had told him he looks up to All Might. To have the person you consider a mentor, your hero, attack like that? A gentle tug on his sleeve draws Shota from his thoughts, and when he glances over at the kid, he finds Midori on his feet. The train had stopped, and the doors are opening. Shota doesn't hesitate to rise to his feet and follow the boy out. Shota takes a second to scan the station, where they're off the train, but there's barely a second to do so as Midori heads towards the exit, almost as if he's moving on autopilot. They walk some more, down a couple streets, and then onto a boardwalk by the ocean. It takes a second too long for Shota to finally realize where they are, and he does so just as a heap of towering junk comes into view. Dagoba Beach. Confusion swirls in his chest, but he doesn't question it, just keeps pace with the student and follows the kid down the stairs leading to the ocean. There isn't much sand that isn't littered with trash or stacked with weathered-down appliances and tossed-away furniture. The place really is a dump. They settle at the edge of the dump site, just three steps of white sand leading them away from the stairs until it transitions swiftly into what looks like endless refuse. Kitchen appliances, trash bags, old mattresses, and outdated electronics. It looks worse than it had the last time he'd come here, which had honestly been years ago. It's common for people to completely ignore the once beautiful beach. Unless you were coming to dump something you no longer want, people tend to avoid the eyesore. Why would the kid want to come here of all places? Shota turns his head to study Midoriya. The boy is staring at the piles of waste with an unreadable expression. He looks... sad, but there's also a knowing, almost assuming look in his eyes. Shota wonders if the beach is any different in Midoriya's reality. Midoriya carries on, unfazed, and Shota can just follow a step or so behind him. He calls out a half-hearted warning for the kid to be careful. A dump like this isn't really the place for someone with a serious, susceptible to infection wound to be hanging out. But if Midori considers this place comforting for whatever reason, who is Shota to deny that? Midori waves him off, not unkindly, with his uninjured hand as he sidesteps half-buried metals and a microwave that has the window smashed out of it. Shota hopes the kid doesn't find any glass or anything hiding in the sand as he follows after him. Steel-toe work boots are much sturdier than Midori's sneakers. Towards the middle of the heap is where Midoriya finally settles. There's a refrigerator that's been dumped on its side, half buried in sand and slanted slightly. Midoriya doesn't seem bothered as he easily scooches his way onto it, shifting around until he's comfortable, before letting his gaze crawl in the direction of the ocean. 
Shota hesitates for just a second before joining the kid. There's a perfect gap between a pile of old wood that looks like it might have been a dining set at some point, and a couple waterlogged boxes that Shota doesn't even want to know what the contents are. It's almost like a window to the ocean. It really is beautiful. Shota remembers the beach being clean and clear when he was just a child. A gentle breeze brushes over his face, and he can almost ignore the scent of landfill as he watches the waves crash against the shore. The water sparkles as the waves ripple. Beside him, Midoriya seems mesmerized, leaning back on his hands and staring out to sea. It's probably the calmest Shota had seen the kid since meeting him, so there must be something about this place that draws Midoriya in despite what the beach has become. Shota himself stays hunched over, elbows on his knees and hands laced together and hanging between his knees. The man lets the silence settle, following Midoriya's lead and just watching the waves. He can't say it's not calming, even surrounded by old junk and trash. So, Shota finally calls attention. After a few peaceful minutes, the boy's eyes linger on the ocean for a moment, like he's trying to pull his gaze away, before his eyes flick in Shota's direction. What is it about this place? Not the most outwardly tranquil, I guess. Midoriya considers his words before looking back at the ocean with a small smile. You're right. He looks thoughtful once again. Shota has half a mind to speak again, but he has a feeling Midoriya isn't quite done yet. His patience is rewarded. My Dagoba Beach looked just like this one, the boy confides, not drawing his gaze away from the ocean. It was cleaned, and it's just... It's so beautiful. My mom never liked me coming here before. Always thought it was dangerous, but after... After it was cleaned up, it just became my favorite, you know? I have a lot of good memories here. Midoriya draws in a breath, finally glancing back at Shoda. It's... unsettling to see it like this again. I put in so much effort cleaning it up and all might he... Well, none of that happened here. Seeing the beach back to how it was... Like it was never even cleaned, like I never put in time and effort. It feels like it was all just a figment of my imagination or something. Like it never really happened when it did. You clean this place up, Shota finds himself asking, glancing around and trying to imagine the beach without all the piles of junk and litter. It's hard. Even when he was a small child, the beach had never been particularly clean. It had looked far better, less of a dump, but never the kind of beach you'd spend the day at during break. Midoriya offers a tiny smile, nodding. It was training, he says. You remember how I told you my All Might helped me train to get into UA? Well, Midoriya bites his bottom lip, gesturing to the junk around them. This was training. I had ten months to clean this place up in order to prove that I was serious about training and becoming a hero. Imagining Midoriya, who, if showed us putting his puzzle pieces together correctly, would have been quirkless at the time, clearing the beach single-handedly, is harder than imagining the beach cleared. He means nothing by it, of course, it's just... He's seen Midoriya's junior high school photo now. The kid is short and scrawny, probably wouldn't have weighed more than a hundred pounds soaking wet. Ten months before the new school year started, Midoriya and Deku would have been the same, Shota assumes. Midoriya has muscle mass now, but back then, he was just skin and bones. How had he moved some of this stuff alone? They're sitting on a refrigerator. It was hard. Midoriya offers, almost as if he can read Shota's thoughts. All Might pushed me hard, but I think I needed that. All my life I was told I couldn't be a hero. My mom cried and apologized. When we found out I supposedly was quirkless, that it was unlikely I'd ever get a quirk. Kids at school weren't very nice, and you know about Kachan already. Midoriya pauses, attention dragging away from the ocean as he angles his head up and stares into the clouded over sky. All Might was the first person to look at me, quirkless and, and different, and believe in me. He pushed me hard, but I prevailed. I cleaned this beach single-handedly, and I proved myself to him, and, and to me, I could be a hero. If I could clean this place up, alone, then I could find a way to be a hero. I was so proud of this place. Shota swallows, looking back out towards the ocean. This must be jarring to the kid. He'd put in so much time and effort, and in this reality, that's all gone. His accomplishment is gone before his eyes. I'm sorry, kid. It's okay. Midoriya laughs humorously. 
wiping at his eyes with the heels of his palms. It's not your fault I'm here, Sensei. It's just a lot to come to terms with, you know? I know that this isn't my reality. My beach is still clean and my... My All Might is there. My Sensei too, and my friends. But you're all just so familiar. It's all the same, but it's not. Sometimes... Sometimes I think I'm back, and this is just a nightmare. <laughs> no offense. But then I come face to face with All Might, or I... I see this place, and I know I'm really here. Shota bites his tongue to keep from apologizing again. He knows it's not his fault, but that doesn't mean the kid doesn't deserve empathy for his situation. It's, frankly, pretty fucked up. His accomplishments are gone. His friendships are gone. Even his connection to his mother, who Shota has gathered he's very close with, just from how Midoriya reacted to Bakugo telling him about her in this reality, is non-existent. The bonds he'd built with his 1A class, teachers and even other pro heroes he would have met through the school year are all gone. Midoriya has nothing in this reality. As accepting and understanding of a situation as they've been, they're still not who Midoriya knows at the end of the day. No matter how hard Shota tries, or what he does, when all is said and done, the poor kid is still isolated in a reality where he's public enemy number one. He's a heroic student, whose image of hero had been swapped to villain in a matter of seconds. That's enough to give anyone emotional whiplash. This is probably so detrimental to his mental health, and it has most definitely affected long-standing relationships he's built up in his reality. Shota feels bad for Midoriya's reality's All Might, whose counterpart has scared the absolute shit out of this kid today. There's bound to be some negative after-effect of that, as minuscule as it might end up being. Shota just wishes they could do right by this kid, at least once. When the man finally manages to drag himself from his thoughts, releasing his bottom lip from where he'd been thoughtlessly worrying it between his teeth, he's unsurprised to find Midoriya still staring out to sea, a distance in his gaze that has showed a stomach tightening with knots. Midoriya's just a kid. You're allowed to not be all right, problem child, Shota tells the kid softly. Midoriya tenses for just a moment, and Shota thinks maybe he'd said the wrong thing, but then Midoriya's shoulders are slumping, and... He's biting down hard on his bottom lip. He reaches up again and scrubs harder at his eyes, sniffling as he does so. I was so scared, the boy finally croaks out, eyes watery and raw from the rubbing. One is more so than the other, the cotton of the bandage on his hand irritating his skin. I know what All Might is capable of. If he really tried to hurt me, he could have... He looks more childlike than Shota thinks he's ever seen a student in his class look. The fear in the boy's eyes is so innocent that it makes Shota's stomach churn. He knows, logically, that 15, 16, 17, and even 18-year-olds are still children in the grand scheme of things, but seeing this now, watching this boy fall apart before his eyes, really makes them seem so young. Shota's heart breaks for the boy. I know. He consoles gently. It's all right. I'm sorry I wasn't there to stop it, and I'm sorry we let this happen to you. We should have told Yagi up front. I shouldn't have let Nezu and Tsukuji make that decision alone. Especially. Not after I saw how the teachers reacted. It was only logical all might, might have as well. And that's not fair to you. We failed you today. Not your fault, the boy sniffles, rubbing at his eyes again. I... I know why they did it, Sensei. I... Probably would have agreed too. At first. I just... I thought they would have told him at some point, you know? We don't know how long I'll be here, and I could understand keeping All Might in the dark if I was only here for a day or two. It would have been easier if that was the case, but we're encroaching on a week now, and that's... that's a long time to keep a secret. To expect a secret to be kept. We should have told him. Shota agrees tightly, pushing down the disappointment he feels in himself. He should have told Yagi, no matter what the rat and Tsukuji thought. No one is blame-free in this. No one except Midoriya, who is just a kid, looking to them for guidance. We put you in danger by keeping this from him. Midori shakes his head, dropping his attention down to his lap. I... He swallows, staring down at his hands. I was just so scared, Sensei. It's all just so... so overwhelming. Everything is just happening all at once, and it feels like I can't catch my breath. I, I mean, the headache was bad enough. It really hurt. But, but to find out it's more, and that they... They chose now for the quirk to manifest something new 
when I'm alone and I don't even have anyone to talk to about it because they're... They don't even really exist, and, and All Might's here, but he's not mine here, and I just... I can't... Midoriya. Shota turns to the boy, shifting enough so that he can set a reassuring hand on the teen's back. Even as his mind whirs as he tries to figure out what the hell the kid's talking about, he forces his attention away from what the kid said, and entirely onto the kid himself, who is teetering towards a panic attack. Hey, hey, shh. Take a breath, kid. You're okay, all right? Shota's head is spinning as he guides the child through some deep breathing, appreciating the moment of just breathing himself as his mind analyzes everything Midoriya just laid out for him. It's a lot. Midoriya stumbles his way through the breathing exercises, and Shota doesn't do anything else besides enunciate his own deep breathing until the kid's panic stuttered breaths even out and his eyes are no longer wide and wild with panic. Midoriya wilts where he's sitting, drawing his legs up and hugging them to his chest. His chin settles on the gap between his knees and his eyes are carefully trained on the sea. The ocean breeze sweeps over them, tossing the boy's curls until his eyes are hidden behind the curtain of green. Sorry, the kid whispers finally. I know that doesn't make any sense to you, and it's not even your problem anyways, just... I don't think we're on the same page here, kid. Shota cuts the teen off, not unkindly, before the boy can spiral. Midori stiffens slightly but doesn't look over. When I agreed to keeping an eye on you, I agreed to everything. Your health, your safety, your problems. I agreed to this, the same way I agreed to watching over my students. To protect them, to keep them safe. I have no doubts that you're one of my students in your reality. Not a single one. And to hear you say that, that whatever you're going through, this, whatever this is that's pushing you to your breaking point, isn't my problem too. I gotta tell you, kid. If you honestly believe that, then I think your eyes always messed up somewhere. It's not that. Midoriya whips towards him frantically. Shota just raises an eyebrow as the kid hugs his knees tighter, eyes wide. He didn't. He never messed up. I trust him. I I trust you. It's just, uh... It really isn't your problem. I mean, I was just venting. Sometimes I do that. I mean, I really didn't mean to say most of that out loud anyways. It's fine. I'm fine. You weren't venting. You were panicking, Shota corrects gently, unsure if the kid is just making excuses or if he honestly thinks he was just venting. There's a difference. A pretty big one, kid. Look, I know you're not where you belong, but shouldering this all alone won't do you any favors. I know you don't have what you need here, but bottling this stuff up until you burst isn't healthy. Midoriya fiddles with his fingers, blatantly refusing to make eye contact. Shota sighs, running his fingers through his hair. Listen, you are my student, you're my ward, in this reality and in your own. Your problems are my problems, no matter what they are, big or small. Anything that's affecting you like this, this negatively, should not be shouldered alone, kid. I can help. I'm here to help you learn and grow, and to help you when you need it. Midoriya is quiet for a long second. Shota is ready to take the loss and accept that there's some things Midori isn't willing to talk about in this reality when the kid finally blows out a nervous breath, turning towards Shota slightly. He looks like he wants to say something, but he still hesitates until... My quirk is... Well, um, it's bigger than I initially thought it was. It's, um, more, I guess. More? Shota cocks his head to the side, frowning thoughtfully. What do you mean? There's more to it, Midoriya offers quietly. It's, um, it's called superpower. I don't know if I told you that already. It's a strength enhancer, really, but that's a very loose classification. It was so hard to use at first, and even still is. And because of that, I was never really able to determine what it was capable of, you know? Not completely, anyway. I think that, well, I know, actually, that those headaches I was having were, um... They were a new branch of my quirk. A new manifestation branching off an original quirk. Shota bites back the surprise, keeping his tone neutral. This is surprising, and it also sounds like another certain someone Shota knows. Is it similar to the original quirk? No, Midoriya shakes his head. Completely different. All right, explain it to me, Shota says calmly. It has to do with the headache, right? How? What does it do? Walk me through it, Midoriya. It's sort of a... Sixth sense, Midoriya tells him thoughtfully. A warning. 
It was alerting me to danger. It's called danger sense, or, or, um, that's what I'm going to call it, I think. The problem is, I don't know what the danger is, just that it's there. It hurt so bad before, right before, and then it just sort of stopped. And it manifested yesterday. Shota cocks his head, trying to understand. This is completely bizarre. This shouldn't be possible, not like this. That was the first time you felt it, at least, right? In Recovery Girl's office. What was the danger then? I assume it was alerting you to All Might this afternoon. I don't know. Midoriya draws in a shaky breath, nodding slightly. Yesterday, in Recovery Girl's office, the headache was just a flicker of pain compared to today. It was quick, different from today. I don't know what happened. There wasn't really any danger yesterday, not that I know of. Maybe it sent something I didn't? Quirks are amazing like that. Midoriya drags his hands down his face, glaring down at his hands when they drop to his ankles. Today, though, it was alerting me to all night. It was sharp and persistent. I've never heard like that before. He was the danger, and it... It threw me for a loop. I know he said that I should... Um... I just wasn't expecting something like this to happen here. I don't have my mentor here. And he always knows how to help. He understands this better than I do. I just... Feel so alone, Sensei. Showed us quiet for a second. Thoughtful. He turns Midoriya's explanation over in his mind before leaning back on his hands as he crosses one ankle over the other and looks out towards the ocean. Do you think All Might might be able to help you with this? Shota finds himself asking against his better judgment. He's not one to beat around the bush, especially when it's something as sensitive as this. Midoriya still startles, slowly turning to study the teacher uncertainly. Shota clicks his tongue fondly, lulling his head in the kid's direction. He is your mentor, isn't he? I'm not an idiot problem child, and you're not as discreet as you think you are. It takes another second for the surprise to drain out of Midoriya's expression, and then the boy is frowning thoughtfully. I actually don't... No. I don't even really know if my All Might would know what's going on. It's... The boy sinks his teeth into his bottom lip. It's anomalous. It is. Shota can agree to that without knowing any more detail. He thinks he's hit the limit with what Midori's willing to share, and honestly... He'd gotten more than he thought he was going to. Yet he still has so many unanswered questions. But we'll figure it out, problem child. This upcoming meeting with Nezu, Yagi, and Tsukuchi had better answer most of his questions, or he's going to be a force to be reckoned with. And on that note... How are you feeling about the meeting this afternoon? The one with All Might? Midoriya hesitates, blowing out a breath. Well, I feel a lot better knowing you're going to be there, too. I know All Might didn't really mean it, you know? It was instinct, but I'm still... Nervous. Shota fills in quietly, only looking away when the boy offers a tiny, sheepish nod. And you're allowed to be. Trust me, though, if that man lays a single hand on you, after everything that's happened, I won't hesitate to break it. Without his quirk, Yagi is just like any other overconfident idiot. That's a little harsh, Sensei. Midoriya huffs out, but Shota counts the tiny smile on the kid's face as a win. Yeah, well, if he can't keep his hands to himself, he deserves it. Midori snickers softly, letting his gaze drift back to the ocean. Sensei. Shota cranes his neck to glance over at the kid, even though Midori isn't looking at him. This meeting. Do you know anything about what this might be about? With all my, the detective, Principal Nezu. Shota isn't sure if the kid is asking for his own sake, or for Shota's. Neither feels particularly better than the other but he has an awful feeling it's the latter, which makes him uncomfortable in a way he can't describe. I have an idea. Midoriya nods, more to himself than anything else, Joda thinks. I don't want to be the one to tell you, Midoriya offers quietly. It's not my place. Not here especially. I know you're smart, Sensei, and I know you've already been questioning things, but just be prepared. It's surprising. Try and keep an open mind about it, all right? It's easier that way. Why does it feel like you're trying to tell me I'm not going to like the outcome of this meeting? Shota sighs out dryly. He'd already had a bad feeling about it, but this is worse. Now he has no idea what to expect at this meeting. We should be getting back. Classes will be finishing up soon, and we still have a train to catch. You ready to go? Yeah, Midoriya nods, slipping off the fridge. I'd like to change my clothes. We sort of smell like we've been sitting in a landfill. We have been sitting in a landfill, Shota quips with a snort of laughter. 
We can stop by the dorms before heading to Nezu's office. I'm sure 1A would like to see you as well, and I'd like to commend them for their actions today. It was ballsy to stand up to All Might for your sake. It's always nice to be proven right when it comes to your students' potential. I'm impressed. I really am thankful, Midoriya bows his head. If it wasn't for the class, I don't know what would have happened. Ida going for help, and Todoroki using his ice to shield me. Shinso and Sarah restraining All Might and everyone putting themselves on the line for me. Everyone did exactly the right thing, I think. They did well. Joda finds himself muttering, ignoring the flurry of pride in his chest. Now, come on. They trek through the sand and junk towards the stairs that led up to the boardwalk. When he chances to glance back at the kid, he can't help but feel relieved at how much better the kid looks after calming down. Hopefully Midoriya won't have any problems during the meeting, because if he ends up crying, Shota just might punch someone in that room. They're just reaching the top of the stairs, stepping onto the boardwalk when it happens. Shota's a couple steps ahead of Midoriya, being faster on stairs with his longer legs. He sees the stranger approaching before they're even close, attention focused on a book in their hands instead of where they're walking. Shota sidesteps out of the way easily, glancing back as the short figure buried in a sweatshirt probably two sizes too big for the small frame passes by without problem. Midori isn't as lucky, the two of them colliding gracelessly. Neither falls, thankfully, but the books the hooded figure had been holding and reading end up toppling to the ground. Shota cocks his head as he turns fully to watch the interaction. They hadn't been lined up to hit one another. Shota had been the one that would have collided with the figure had he not moved. Whereas Midoriya had been more to show to side, and it's almost like the figure had veered in his path to collide with Midoriya, intentionally. That doesn't make much sense, though. Uh, sorry, Midoriya yelps after steadying his balance. He's quick to crouch down, just as the other figure had done, helping pick up the fallen books on the ground. There's just two, so they each manage to grab one. I must not have been... Midoriya trails off, staring down at the journal in his hands for a second before blinking up at the figure. Looking where I was going. The figure stands first, and Midori is quick to rise after them, looking down at the journal for another long second before wordlessly holding the book he'd picked up out for the other to take. Sorry again. Midoriya offers a half-hearted smile. It doesn't reach his eyes. Shota can see as much. And there's something a bit off about the way Midori is looking at the hooded figure. It's fine. The hooded figure, a boy, Shota thinks, sounding not much older than Midoriya, replies tightly. There's something about the rough, nasally-sounding voice that comes off as... fake. You're one of those UA students, aren't you? Uh, oh, um... Midoriya blinks. The other kid must glance down at Midori's uniform in explanation, as the teen's gaze drops down to look at his uniform as well before returning his attention to the other, offering yet another bashful, yet hesitant smile. Right. Um, y yeah, yeah, UA student. The uniform, right. Shota squints at the exchange as the figure finally takes the book back. Midoriya's hands fall to his sides as the hooded boy hugs the two notebooks to his chest, tucking his hand into the pouch pocket of a sweatshirt he wears. They stare at each other uncertainly, almost observing one another. Once again, Shota has a bad feeling settling in his stomach, but Midoriya isn't outwardly expressing any discomfort besides the hesitance, so he pushes the feeling down and watches intently. He can't come to the kid's defense if Midoriya doesn't need him there and the stranger hasn't done anything suspicious, as weird as he seems to be. Still, this staring contest they're having has him on edge. Is Midori seeing something Shota isn't? Kid, Shota calls, tucking his hands into his pockets casually. We'll miss the train. Uh, uh, r right. Thank you, the hood figure finally says, pulling his hand from his pocket and clasping it onto Midori's hand in an unexpected handshake. Midori looks surprised by the contact, staring wide-eyed down at their hands before lifting his gaze to look at the hooded boy. The green-haired teen furrows his brow as he opens his mouth to speak, but ultimately just shuts his mouth and tilts his head suspiciously. The hooded boy clears his throat, continuing casually. For the help picking up my books. You didn't have to. I ran into you. I wasn't paying attention. Oh! Midoriya squints, eyes flicking down once again to their clasped hands. Any time. Shota sees the hooded figure nod, shifting slightly to the side and almost blocking his vision of their still interlocked hands. The hero can just barely make out how the figure pulls his hand away slowly, curling his palm up along the student's hand so Midori's fingers clasp into a loose fist. It's nice to meet a UA student. Good luck. I hear it's hard for people like us. 
The figure doesn't wait for a reply. Pulling away from Midoriya completely and hurrying away from them before Midoriya or Shota can get a word in. He disappears down a path leading towards the streets before the man can so much as blink, let alone get a good look at the kid. Midoriya. Shota doesn't hesitate to focus his attention on his student, all while watching the figure disappear from sight out of the corner of his eye. He'd never been more thankful to have the ability to split his attention that came with both heroics and teaching. What was that all about? Was he familiar to you? from your reality. Uh, Midoriya's startled expression melts away to confusion. I don't know, Sensei. I don't think so. Not familiar, but I don't know. I just got this weird feeling. Midoriya's hand tightens into an actual fist as he slips both hands into the pockets of his slacks. His shoulders are tense, and there's a distant look in the kid's eyes, but he doesn't say anything. The boy turns slowly to look in the direction the kid had left him, but he's long gone by now. Midoriya stares for a long second, worrying his bottom lip between his teeth before looking back at Shota. The kid hesitates. That was weird, but... Danger sense didn't go off. Shota frowns at that. I suppose he didn't mean any harm, then, the hero says stiffly, still glaring in the direction that Tina disappeared. Maybe he didn't mean harm, but he was still strange. Yue does get a lot of attention, and the uniform is recognizable, to the general public. The interaction didn't seem malicious, as odd as it was. No, Midoriya agrees distantly. It didn't feel malicious. Midoriya glances back at the path, almost in disbelief, staring hard for another long second before thoughtfully dropping his gaze down to his shoes. His frown deepens as he stares down, before he's lifting his attention back to the man. All uncertainty is gone from his expression, and that familiar half-smile showed had grown used to seeing on the kid's face is back. The boy tugs his hands out of his pockets as he finally continues on to join Shoda at his side again. At least it was a positive interaction this time, the teen mumbles lightly, his tone coming out breathy and amused, but Shoda doesn't find the situation humorous at all. The hero bites his tongue, forcing himself to resume his walking as Midoriya pulls ahead with a couple quick paces forwards. They fall into step, side by side, as they head back towards the train station. That doesn't make me feel better about any of this. Shota finally sighs tiredly, allowing the topic to drop. Shota silently turns the interaction between Midoriya and the stranger over in his head as they walk, deciding with a grimace that something about it doesn't sit right with him. He doesn't know what the hell that was all about, but it was definitely weird. That seems to be a theme. A short train ride and a bit of a walk has Izuku and Sensei returning back to campus. His teacher had been worryingly quiet after the odd run-in with that stranger, but Izuku can't really say much considering he'd been just as quiet and just as thoughtful. Izuku hadn't gotten a good look at the teen, but there was something about him that had Izuku feeling a little uneasy. It wasn't danger per se. He hadn't felt even a whisper of pain in his head, so he had to assume there was no malicious intent coming from the stranger. Danger sense was new to him but if he'd learned anything thus far, it was to trust the new quirk's instinct. Malicious intent really does come in all forms, and he's glad that's the wisdom the vestige had thought to impart to him. It was still odd, though. The boy follows his teeter up the steps leading to the 1A dorms, expressing blank as he moves on autopilot, thoughts lost in that strange encounter, and the upcoming meeting. He doesn't know which one he should be more worried about. He's expecting to find... 1A kids waiting for them when they finally pull the doors open and step into the Genkin, but he's not expecting Togata-senpai to be waiting awkwardly in the common area. Izuku freezes, thoughts stalling in his head as he scans the upperclassmen uncertainly. You're okay, the older teen breathes out, standing from the couch and making his way swiftly to where Izuku had stopped. I was so worried after I heard what happened. Izuku flounders for a second, glancing back at Sensei, but the man is just surveying over the two students with an unreadable expression. He makes no move to intervene or say anything. Izuku frowns to himself. What? I'm so sorry. Togata arches into a bow, body tense. Izuku takes a step back in surprise. It was my fault, Midoriya-kun. I just mentioned that I met you. I didn't think he'd react like that. I'm sorry. I thought he knew about Aizawa-sensei's personal student. Everyone else seems to, so I just... I assumed, and I didn't think, because of that. He went after you. He hurt you. And I didn't even know until the student in 1B was talking about it after school. I had a really bad feeling about it, so I asked some of the other 1A students and... Togeta bites hard at his bottom lip, looking away sharply. He could have... I would have helped you. He just rushed off, you know. 
I thought it might be hero business. I let him go without question because I thought someone needed him, you know? I can't even wrap my head around the fact that he left training in such a hurry to attack you, and I didn't even hear about it until after classes. I've been waiting here to make sure you're all right. It's not your fault, Izuku shuffles awkwardly in place. He doesn't know what to do, with his senpai bowed over, expressing genuine apology. It's weird, especially since Izuku knows Togata had no ill intentions when mentioning him. Please don't apologize. We... Knew from the beginning that All Might might have a problem with me. It's not your fault. What he did, and I'm fine now. Togata straightens up, mouth pulled downwards in a frown as he studies Suzuku. Still, the older boy breathes out. It should have never happened. He didn't even ask any questions, just tensed up when I mentioned your name, and that you were Sensei's personal student. I swear, I was just telling him how nice you were, but he just sort of lost it. I never would have mentioned you if I'd known. I know. Izuku offers a sympathetic half-smile. Please don't blame yourself. I don't blame you. I don't even... I don't blame All Might either. And besides, some bruises. I'm completely fine. Sensei scoffs behind Izuku, but the boy refuses to look back over his shoulder. It's not your fault, Sensei adds sharply. If anything, it's the adults who are to blame, Tokuda. Like Midoriya said, we suspected Yagi might have a problem with Midoriya, and we still chose to keep his presence here from him. I explicitly told my class to keep this quiet, but logically, we couldn't expect the entire student body to be on the same page. I still feel bad, Togata tells him, looking genuinely upset. Midoriya got hurt because of me. I was the one who told All Might about him. He could have really hurt him. But he didn't, Izuka tries to console the senpai. If All Might really wanted to hurt me, he would have. He could have killed me, and after everything Deku did... I don't know, I don't think he has a right to harm Deku, but I think he has a right to be angry. Besides, I had 1am present Mike Sensei protecting me too. I really don't blame you at all, Senpai. Togata's face scrunches up uncomfortably, and Aizawa Sensei clenches his jaw and looks away. But Izuku knows that that's the truth of the matter. And they both seem to know that as well. As hard as All Might had gone, he'd still used restraint. All Might obviously still has one for all in this reality. He'd come into the gym in his one for all form, and had the speed and power to boot. It's there. Even if Izuka doesn't know the degree of it the man has left, All Might had done so much with just those remaining embers of the quirk after he'd passed it down to Izuku, but here... He doesn't know the timeline for the quirk. It's obvious Togata has it now, but when had he passed it over? How would that change things? Still, Izuku knows All Might could have killed him. He'd held back. The more he turns that attack over in his head, the more he knows All Might hadn't been aiming to incapacitate as much as being shoved into a wall at hurt, and as scary as it was. He could have easily taken Izuku out, even if it was a one-for-all versus one-for-all battle. All Might is still superior. He has something Izuku doesn't. Age and experience. Izuku bites at his bottom lip. Do you... know why All Might was so upset, Togata-senpai? The blonde pauses before offering a careful nod. You're Deku from another reality, right? After I asked some of the 1A students about the attack, I asked why he'd ever do something like that to someone like you, and they explained it to me. I really had no idea. If I'd have known, I wouldn't have mentioned you. He has a grudge against Deku, and it's warranted, I think, but just because you and Deku are the same people doesn't mean you're the same, you know? Togata hesitates. I think he had a good reason to do what he did, but that doesn't make it all right. Deku works with the League, and they're capable of some pretty scary stuff. I know, Izuku breathes out, bowing his head. I understand. Togata's eyebrows furrow as he studies Izuku carefully. Well, glad that some of us are on the same page, Sensei's eyes dryly. The rest of us will just struggle along. Izuku feels his cheeks heat up and Togata offers a sheepish laugh. Um, sorry, Sensei, just... Yeah, yeah, Sensei waves him off. Secrets, I get it. The both of you have been trained well but I will be getting answers. I assume they'll be coming directly from the source. Now, off you go, problem child. Change your clothes before we head to Nezu's office. Wait, you guys are heading there too? Togata cocks his head in surprise. I was summoned by Nezu, Sensei. I was worried I'd have to head over there without making sure Midori-kun was okay first. I... Not too sure what this'll be about, but if you two are going too, I'm pretty curious now. You're going to this meeting. Sensei narrows his eyes, but doesn't look as surprised as Izuku thinks he should. Izuku himself had assumed that All Might's successor in this reality might be invited to be a part of the talk. Togata hesitates before nodding uncertainly. Figures. This just keeps getting better and better. 
It's about time they laid everything out on the table. Now, off you go, problem child. Togata will walk over together as a group wait here. Yes, Sensei. The two teens chime together before hurrying to do as directed. Izuku heads toward the stairs, and Togata plops back down on the couch, expression a little tighter than when they'd first met up with the man. Izuku wonders where the class is, but he remembers it's just after school at this point. Most of them will still be out of the dorms for a while, whether they're studying, training, or just hanging out. Mike Sensei also isn't in the apartment upstairs, so Izuku quickly sneaks off into the spare room he'd been staying in to change his clothes. The walk to the main school building is quiet. Izuku and Togata are on either side of Sensei, and the man is just as quiet as he leads them along. His shoulders are slumped, and his hands nestled in the pockets of his hero costume, but his eyes are sharp and thoughtful. Izuku glances briefly at his upperclassmen, noting the uncertainty in his senpai's expression. Izuku's sure he'd have the same expression if the roles were reversed, and he was walking into a meeting where the secret of the insanely powerful quirk he possesses was revealed to his teacher. His Aizawa sensei, no less. Izuku will admit he's scared about how this will go down. He's scared to face All Might, and he's scared for everything to be laid out before them. He's a little scared of how Sensei is going to react, and he's also a bit scared for Togata to learn they share a quirk. He's an outsider here, and learning that he's the chosen one in another reality might be overwhelming for his teacher, upperclassman, and All Might himself. Then there's the fact that Izuku isn't sure even how he'd react if he was in Togata's shoes. If a Shigaraki from another reality turned up in their own, wielding the power of one for all and claiming to be a hero, that would be hard to process, let alone accept completely. He's a villain here. He's a villain who has All Might's powerful, transferable quirk. At least Nezu and the detective already know, already believe, Izuku isn't sure what he'd do if he had to explain this to everyone. And both the detective and principal can be scary. He's not sure he'd even have the gall to explain it to everyone if the situation was different. A different scary... Then All Might and Aizawa Sensei, more intense, less familiar. Still, there's something unsettling about One for All being shared, even if technically this isn't about Izuku's One for All. Nor is it really his All Might, Sensei, Principal Nezu, or Detective Suguchi. He's scared, but he's also curious. It's different here. He might even get some more answers about Deku. Things still aren't adding up right. As far as he knows, he and Deku live the same life up until a certain point and he steadily gathered the similarities up until he meets the number one pro. Sensei leads them into the school, and before long they arrive outside Principal Nezu's office. Izuku bites his lip as he thinks back to that first day here, after that terrible, terrible stay at the police station while they sorted everything out. It doesn't feel any less scary, standing outside Nezu's office. Sensei knocks on the door, and within a second, it's pulled open, and a pleased-looking Principal Nezu quirks his head at them. Perfect timing, Aizawa-kun. And it looks like you brought the rest of our party with you as well. Excellent. The rodent gestures them in, and Izuku is only mildly surprised to find a table of six chairs taking up the main space of the office. There hadn't been a table the last time he'd been in the office, so it must be just for this. He assumes Nezu-sensei would have a soundproof office, with all the confidential meetings the rodent must have as a pro-hero, and a principal of an elite hero school. I have tea prepared, the rodent tells them with a toothy smile. Please, take a seat. Anywhere you feel comfortable. We have a lot to discuss. We're all familiar with one another, yes? Izuku sees the detective and All Might, sitting at the table already. All Might is on one side, and Tsukuchi has taken the head at the table at All Might's side. Togata surveys over the room, glancing back at Izuku before moving and settling himself at All Might's side. And Nezu is already hoisting himself up into the seat across from Tsukuchi, which is already stacked with books, so he's at their height. Aizawa-sensei lingers beside Izuku, and it takes an embarrassingly long second to realize the man is giving him the chance to pick the seat he's most comfortable in. Neither is much better than the other, but Principal Nezu had threatened to send him to Tartarus, which had scared him more so than he'd like to admit, so Izuku awkwardly takes the seat beside the man. Sensei settles easily in the last chair, and Izuku is more relieved than he'd care to admit having Sensei so close. He's unsettled. He doesn't need to look up to know Yagi-san's gaze is on him, and that the detective is watching him so very intently. He can feel the sympathy coming off of Togeda and waves, and Sensei's frame at his side is tense and impatient. It's silent for another long second as Nezu settles into his seat, gesturing to the teapot in the middle of the table. Yagi-san stands, pouring everyone a cup, but no one but Nezu himself really drinks it. There's a lot we should discuss. The rodent starts them off casually, flicking beady black eyes around at everyone sitting at the table. Yagi-san, would you like to start us off? 
The retired pro hesitates, glancing at Izuku guiltily before clearing his throat. First, Yagi-san starts, lacing his fingers together nervously. I owe you an apology, Midoriya-kun. I acted rashly after I heard you were in the school, and I didn't stop to consider anything past the fact. I'm a hero, first and foremost, so hearing that... that Midoriya Izuku, Deku, was in the school, so close to our students, I reacted. Izuku shifts hesitantly, refusing to make eye contact. He bites down on his lip as he tries to figure out what to say. He really has no idea what to say, how to act. I... don't blame you. You scared the shit out of him, Yagi. Sensei grumbles out lowly. Leaning back against the backrest of his chair as he narrows the blonde pro a dark look. All Might shifts like Aizawa Sensei scares him, looking down at his own hands shamefully. I know, All Might admits quietly. And I apologize for that. I was ill-informed. When I heard the name Midori Izuku, my intention was to protect the school and the students. I take responsibility for how I acted. And I assure you, I've gotten a stern talking to from both Nezu-san and Detective Tsukuchi. I really am sorry, young Midoriya. Izuku almost wants to cry, as the familiar nickname comes from the alternate All Might. He'd missed it. Missed hearing it and missed being so close to All Might. He'd missed having a confidant and having someone to talk to about the quirk. He's missed All Might. I can vouch for the fact that Yagi-san has indeed been reprimanded and will be doing intensive revision of how his reaction was unacceptable for a school setting with me personally, Nezu says calmly, sipping at his tea. Izuku draws in an unsteady breath, turning the apology over in his head. We... He starts slowly, swallowing down his nerves as he refuses to look up from his lap. We can't put the entire blame on All Might. The silence that follows the statement has Izuku's heart thrumming in his chest. Anxiety curls in his chest and he fiddles with his fingers as the room remains quiet. He can feel everyone's gaze on him. Moving before you realize it is what makes you a good hero. Izuku tells the room quietly, still refusing to lift his gaze. He doesn't want to see anyone's faces. All my thought I was a danger to the class, to the entire school, and he was just making sure no one got hurt. He was protecting everyone. We can't blame him for that. It would be hypocritical. Everyone was wary of me when I first got here. We can't fault All Might for doing the same thing. The silence rings. It's loud in Izuku's ears, but he knows he can't leave it there. He draws in another shaky breath, clearing his throat as he finally lifts his eyes to look at All Might. All Might didn't know. And, and I'm not trying to blame anyone else. I know this decision wasn't taken lightly, but it's not fair of us to hold him to a different standard when he reacted just the same as anyone else. I can't blame All Might for a hero's, no, a human's reaction. Young man. Yagi is the first to find his voice breathy and confused. There's a deep, shameful frown on the man's face. You're defending me. After everything I did in the gym. He does that. Eyes always and say sighs heavily, leaning back in his chair and massaging at his eyes like this conversation is already giving him a headache. He looks tired. I'm still trying to wrap my head around it, too. He has a point. Tsukuchi breathes out, finally tearing his eyes off of Izuku and looking around the room at his colleagues. We owe Midoriya an apology, too. Yagi reacted poorly, but it wasn't completely unjustified. Of course, Nezu nods seriously. Quirks like this, intricate and powerful enough to send someone to another reality, are almost unheard of, yet to have the sheer power for the effects to last after a couple days. We'd hope the boy would have been gone before this point. It really is unfortunate. That's not an apology. Aizawa Sensei huffs tiredly, shooting Nezu Sensei a bland look. The rodent lets out a toothy smile. Of course, aizawa -kun. I do apologize, Midori-kun. A great deal of the situation falls onto the shoulders of myself and the detective. We made the decision that ultimately led to this, so we're the two who should take the blame for this outcome. I'm sorry, Midoriya, Tsukuchi adds gently from Izuku's side. Apologies won't make it better, but we are sorry. We made a decision that turned out to be the wrong one, and that affected you. I don't blame anyone, Izuku tells them awkwardly. It's unfortunate, but... I can see this from everyone's angle. All Might was protecting the school. Principal Nezu and Detective Tsukuti were protecting All Might, Togata, and me by extension. Aizawa Sensei, you were just trying to keep me safe by following their lead. Fat lot of good that did you, Sensei snorts out humorlessly. You might not blame us, but we're all to blame. We could have handled this better from the start, and at the end of the day, we didn't. That's on us. 
You know, you don't have to just accept bad things happening like this. You can be upset and angry and hurt. Izuku looks up to Tokuda across the table in surprise. The older boy is watching him with a frown. I don't exactly understand yet, but I know enough to know that you got hurt by this. I got hurt by this. I didn't even know it was a secret, and I didn't know All Might would react like he did. It feels like it's my fault Midoriya got hurt in the first place. And that doesn't feel fair when I was just talking about the nice new student I met. I truly am sorry, All Might bows his head. To both young Midoriya and you as well, young Tokuda. I used your ease around me, our personal relationship in a way I never should have. That hurt you. The fault lies in me, my boy, not you. You didn't know. We've kept the name Midori Izuku out of the media for a reason. What is the reason? Togata looked around at the pros. Izuku swallows, letting his gaze drop back to his lap. If you all knew Midori was Deku, and that Deku is Midori Izuku, why wouldn't you tell anyone? Shouldn't everyone know? He has a name. Surely there's an actual photo of him somewhere. Tsukuchi hesitates for just a second. Midoriya Izuku is... dead. Dead? Togata breathes out, confused gaze sweeping towards the other student before looking back to the pros and detective. Pronounced dead, Tsukuchi men slowly, like the words taste unpleasant. He supposedly committed suicide. Over a year ago, no body was found. He left a note identifying himself, and that's enough for the department to close his case. They didn't look for him? Togata asked desperately, scanning the room. Izuku bows his head down further, breath getting caught in his throat. He'd probably have choked on that breath, too, if Aizawa Sensei's hand hadn't have settled grounding on his knee under the table. Isn't that protocol? Search and rescue? What if he survived? If he left a note and no body was recovered, that means he must have... Why wouldn't... I'm afraid the world is still largely discriminative towards the corkless, my boy. Quirkless? Togata breathes out, eyes shooting back to Izuku. The younger curls into himself, and not even Sensei's light hand on his knee helps the drowning feeling. Midoriya has a quirk. He told me about it, a strength enhancer that... Wait. Izuku bows his head further down, squeezing his eyes shut as Togata pauses. He hears Togata's sharp inhale of breath and knows that the boy has made the connection. How is that even possible? We were just as surprised. Nezu tells the young man solemnly. Alas, from the first moment I truly believed Midori Kun's story, he confided in me. It was a trust I shouldn't have been privy to after everything in that interrogation room, and yet I was. And it is quite difficult to bypass a quirk like the detectives, especially in an emotional state. When the hell did he do that? Aizawa Sensei rears back, looking suspiciously at Nezu. I was with him the whole time, and you haven't once been alone with the kid. I'd know if he did something like that. Something as simple as a nod. Aizawa kun can say a lot. Sensei narrows his eyes, stewing silently as he eyes his boss. So it's really true, then? Togata turns wide eyes to All Might. He's just like... Indeed, my boy. All Might sighs tiredly. I'll admit that's a part of the reason I couldn't see past my pursuit of Midoriya. A diagnosed quirkless boy having a quirk after working with the League? That made him even more dangerous. It clouded my judgment. Not to mention it's seemingly impossible for him to also possess. All Might tapers off hesitantly, glancing over at Izuku. Izuku draws in a deep breath. He hadn't even thought of that. If Deku worked with the League, with all for one, there is a chance he might have been given a quirk. The thought makes him sick to his stomach. He can't imagine ever taking a quirk like that. But he's not really Deku, is he? If someone doesn't tell me what the hell is going on, I'm going to flip this table. Sensei snarls in annoyance, straightening up and glaring around the table. He carefully avoids looking at Izuku and Togata both, saving the malice in his gaze, just for the adults. Enough being cryptic. If you think you're getting out of this without telling me what involves these two students and All Might, you're sorely mistaken. This has gone on long enough, and I'm tired of being left in the dark. Aizawa-san. All Might clears his throat. It's nothing personal towards you, it's just... If you tell me it's a secret one more time, and don't tell me what the secret entails, Yagi, I will jump over this table and throttle you with my capture weapon. Consequences be damned. Sensei! Izuku squeaks out, mortified. Yagi-san inches back minutely, away from the dark-haired man, frowning hard at Aizawa Sensei like he's just seconds away from making good of that promise. It's weird seeing someone as mighty as All Might cowering back from Aizawa Sensei. Just proves how terrifying his homeroom teacher really can be. Izuku is glad to have the man on his side, instead of against him. 
Now, now, Nezu chimes in, sternly yet chipper. Enough of that, Aizawakun. I understand you're upset, but the threat of bodily harm is not very professional. Now, you're here because I'm going to insist you be accredited to this. You must understand, Aizawakun, that what will be said in this office is highly confidential. There's a good reason why you and everyone else have been kept in the dark for so long, but after today, I believe you have the right to know, if only for Midoriya-kun's sake. Sente watches Principal Nezu skeptically for a long second before shifting his attention to All Might. I want to hear it from you. Everything just keeps leading back to you, All Might. Yagi-san is quiet for a long second, glancing first to Tsukuchi, then to Tokuda, and finally to Izuku. The man draws in a breath. Do you remember, all for one, Aizawa-san, or perhaps no of is a better word? All for one. The man narrows his eyes suspiciously. The villain you arrested after Bakugo's kidnapping, who worked with the League? Of course, it was televised on national news. He's in Tartarus, isn't he? What's he got to do with this? All for one has a very unique, a very powerful quirk, Aizawa-san. His villainous reign far predates us all. He's been at large for a long time, under my nose, really. He's powerful, Aizawa-san. And he's dangerous. Sensei leans back in his chair thoughtfully, expression still pinched with annoyance. Okay. What does this have to do with this? With these kids? What's his quirk exactly? Yagi-san winces, glancing helplessly at both Nezu and Tsukuchi. All for one can take and give quirks. Sensei pauses, staring hard at All Might. What? You heard me, Aizawa-san. Yagi-san sighs. He can steal quirks, he can take them, and he can either keep them for himself or he can give them away at will. The recipient can be willing or unwilling. He is the worst of the worst, Aizawa-san, dangerous beyond what you can imagine. Ragdoll's quirk was gone when she was recovered. Sensei breathes out eyes wide. He took her quirk. He can use search now. Yes. Yagi bows his head solemnly. Assuming he kept it for himself. You must understand, Aizawa-san. It was believed all for one was dead. I fought him years ago and he should have died. I truly believed he was dead. I was wrong. All for one is dangerous, Aizawa. This secret is dangerous. We kept you in the dark because letting you in puts you at risk. So you wouldn't tell us? The teachers at this school, pro-heroes, because it's dangerous. Sensei's surprise quickly shifts to narrowed anger. But you told these two kids. You put them in danger, told them the secret. What the hell is wrong with you people? This is something you refuse to tell pros, but you've told schoolboys. Aizawa, Tsukuchi warns lightly. Don't Aizawa me, Tsukuchi. Sensei snaps his attention to the other man before whipping back to address All Might. Why do these two students know this highly confidential, dangerous secret? Why aren't you telling me? Why are they involved in all this? The man cuts himself off, blinking owlishly. He's quiet for a long second. You have a quirk, Sensei says blandly, turning oh so slowly towards Izuku. How did you get a quirk in your reality? Izuku feels dizzy all of a sudden, lungs stuttering to a stop as panic wells in his chest. Sensei doesn't think he... that he was actually working with... Aizawa! Yagi-san snaps from across the table, but Izuku can't tear his gaze away from his own clenched fists. Be suspicious of me all you want, but don't turn on that boy beside you. If he possesses one for all, he's trustworthy. I gave him that quirk. You what? Sensei's voice drops low, eyes narrowing to slits as he watches the retired pro. That's impossible. Well, well um, my All Might did. Izuku finally manages to wheeze out. He... He gave it to me, at the start of the school year, r right before the entrance exam. That's... that's how I got into UA. Our All Might gave me our realities one for all, Togata adds cautiously, studying both Izuku and Aizawa. He draws in a breath and continues despite the hesitance in his eyes. Right after the student from 1A was kidnapped and Yagi-san fought all for one again. That's impossible. Sensei pauses, blinks, looks to Izuku, then Togata. Then back to Izuku where his eyes narrow slightly. Unless. Unless it's not. It's not, Yagi breathes out. One for all is transferable. It's a power stockpile that was forced upon, all for one's quirkless brother. The brother unknowingly had a transference quirk with no other use but to transfer. The two quirks merged into what's now known as one for all. It's been shared and strengthened over time. The first person cultivates the power, then passes it to another. The next refines it and passes it on again. It's transferable. 
but only through transferred DNA, and unlike all for once quirk, it can only be given and taken willingly. There were eight wielders of the quirk before Togata and Midoriya. I was the eighth, and I passed it on when the time came, in both realities, apparently. You're being serious, Sensei mutters, glancing around the table and studying everyone carefully. His voice comes out breathy and in disbelief. It... that makes sense. Izuku nods slowly when Sensei's gaze settles on him. This quirk, Sensei starts hesitantly, gaze back on All Might after a silent second where everyone lets the conversation sink in. One for all. What does it stockpile? All Might blinks, frowning thoughtfully. It stockpiles power. Surely you've seen both young Togata and young Midori use the power Aizawa san. They've each used it differently, like every other to possess the quirk, but it's the same energy stockpile. Yes, but could it stockpile quirks? Sensei edges carefully, eyes refined and narrowed. He doesn't give anything away, but Izuku instantly knows what the man is hinting towards. Quirks? Yagi-san frowns thoughtfully. Like, of the past users? Not that I know of, as far as I've heard at least. My mentor didn't mention anything of the sort when she explained the quirk to me, and I never felt anything of the sort either. The man pauses, quiet for another second as he cocks his head in thought. I suppose it's possible. Izuka draws in a shaky breath. It most definitely is possible. There is an uncomfortable silence, one that carries on for far too long in Izuka's opinion. He refuses to look up, but he can feel eyes on him. It makes him want to squirm. Finally, All Might breaks the tense silence. Why? I... Izuka swallows, drawing in another shaky breath. I manifested another one. It feels wrong, telling so many people, but not his own All Might. It feels wrong saying this when Aizawa-sensei is settled at his side, thoughtful and observant and no doubt putting more together than they think he is. How do you know? Yagi-san asks carefully, but not blatantly shutting the idea down. Izuku winces at it still, wanting to avoid eye contact, but knowing he can't, he swallows down the fear and looks up, catching All Might's gaze and holding eye contact. He told me. Who? This question comes from Suguchi, low and intense, maybe even a little bit suspicious, Izuku can't hold that against him. This sounds suspicious, too. He knows All Might has never had the same kind of interactions with the Quirk, and it's possible neither has Togata. One of the vestiges, Izuku forces out, keeping eye contact with All Might and scanning the surprise in the man's face. I... I don't know which one. He didn't give me a name. He just... He told me what it was. What was happening. Danger sense. That's the Quirk. It... Alerted me to All Might's presence this afternoon. Warned me his intent was malicious. Malicious? Yagi-san repeats quietly, shamefully. He shakes himself in the shame, gazes back on Izuku. I've never heard of danger since that predates my mentor, and... And her mentor as well. You've interacted with these vestiges. I have, Izuku admits. How? This comes from Suguchi once again. I don't really know, Izuku tells them honestly. The first time it happened was outside the quirk. Izuku sees the way Yagi mouths the words outside the quirk to himself like he can't believe it. It really does sound insane, Izuku knows. His All Might had agreed. It was during the sports festival, Izuku continues. When I was fighting Shinso, he managed to get me under his quirk. I saw All Might in the doorway leading to the arena, but there were others behind him. Shadowy figures, seven of them, and you watching me. It was like I had more power after that. That's how I managed to break out of Shinso's quirk. That was the first time they showed themselves, I guess. Sukuchi, Nezu glances quickly at the detective, gaze calculating and curious. True, the detective admits breathlessly. All of it. I see, Nezu breathes out, whiskers arching forward in interest. In this new interaction with the Midoriya-kun, the one inside, the one for all. Izuku thinks back to what he can remember of it. Shinso was involved again, he tells them. Danger sense comes through as a sharp headache, and it really hurts. I guess I was pulling at my hair or doing something else to distract myself. I don't really remember. But it was after he had me under his quirk that I... I don't know. I went there? Went where? Sensei asks at Izuku's side. Into the quirk, he whispers uncertainly. I think, at least. I was bound in it. It, um... The quirk, I think, held me in place, and he was there, 
Danger since his previous owner. My mouth was covered by the quirk, and I don't know if I was supposed to be able to talk, but I could. He told me what the pain was, and that practice would help me master danger sense. I wasn't there long. When I was shaken from Shinzo's quirk, I was a bit disoriented, and then All Might, well... He doesn't think anyone needs the reminder of All Might showing up. No one says anything for a long second. Izuku glances around subtly, but everyone just looks like they're trying to process this. All Might looks the most perplexed by this, and Togata looks spooked. Izuku understands, until now they'd believe the quirk to be one thing. Now there's a possibility it could be several things. Izuku would be spooked by that too, if it hadn't happened to him first. Nezu and Tsukuchi both look to be processing this too, and even Sensei is silent at Izuku's side. He stares at the wall over Togata's head, tapping one finger on the edge of the table. Yagi-san. Izuku looks up to Togata when he hears the older boy's voice. Will I... I mean, none of that's happened to me. Will... I don't know. The man drags his palms down his face. It's possible, I assume, if it's happening to young Midoriya, but... This truly is the first I'm hearing of this. I never experienced anything quite like this, either in all the years I had the quirk and sensei. She never mentioned it either. We truly know so little about one for all. I don't know why or how, or if it'll happen to you as well. It could very well be Midoriya's reality, Nezu adds thoughtfully. There's no guarantee that Togata-kun will manifest the quirk quite like Midoriya-kun. We've seen the quirk act differently in different hands. He surfaced from a completely different world. Despite the similarities, let's not forget that. One for all could be different. You did say each wielder refines it, Tsukuji reminds. Midoriya has had the quirk longer than Togata. He's had more practice with it. I've had the most practice, and nothing of the sort has happened, Yagi-san shrugs. I don't think we can follow logic like that. One for all isn't this nor that. It's constantly getting stronger and growing. That's why it's the only thing that I believe we'll be able to stop all for one. Maybe it just likes the kid, Sensei huffs out. Maybe we're looking for answers that don't exist. I mean, maybe he needs them. It's not like he randomly manifested it. It manifested for a reason. And even then, he was still blindsided by this reality. Now, Yagi, did you go to Recovery Girl's office yesterday? Yesterday? The man froze his brow. Oh, yes, I did. It was late afternoon. She asked to see me to check on my injury. After passing on one for all to young Togata, it's been acting up, but how did you... That's when the kid first had the headache. Just for a second. There and then gone as we waited for her to clear him to leave. Sensei explains, carting his fingers through his hair. Did you turn around, or get distracted or something? Yagi frowns. I forgot my shoulder bag in the staff office. So you went back to go get it. Aizawa scrunches his nose up. It's a damn good thing we left when we did yesterday. We would have run into you in the hall. Midori wouldn't have been the only one with a headache had that interaction happened. So, it was a brief warning. Nezu cocks his head at Aizawa Sensei before glancing over at Izuku like, he's a complex puzzle that needs to be solved. Fascinating. I... Togata calls attention to himself, looking a bit pale. I'm just... Um... <clears throat> A bit overwhelmed by all this. Could I be... Excuse, please. I'd like to think. Of course, Togata-kun, Nezu grants. You're excused. We understand this is a lot to process, so please come to any one of us if you'd like to talk about it. Thank you, sir, the older boy blows out, slowly standing up. I'll keep that in mind. Togata dismisses himself with a bow, offering a light smile, even as his eyes are clouded with thought and confusion. Izuka thinks he's already mulling over everything that had been said in this room. Izuku hopes he isn't upset that he hasn't manifested any other quirks, or that he'll chase after something that might not happen to him, too. Well, Nezu chimes in, glancing around at the group. I believe Togata-kun had the right idea. I think we should all take the evening to think. I suppose that's everything for now, isn't it? There's a murmur of agreement, and everyone starts to rise out of their seats. Uh, actually, Izuku pipes up sheepishly. I have a question for Yagi-san. I'm all ears, my boy. The pro resettles in his chair. Everyone else lowers back into their seats as well, all eager for the question. Izuka tries not to feel overwhelmed. Have we met before? Izuku pauses, then backtracks when Yagi cocks his head in confusion. I mean, Deku, of course. Have you met Deku prior to this? I don't believe so, the man frowns. I think I'd remember meeting someone like him. Why? Should we have met? How did we meet in your reality, if you don't mind me asking? Izuku sucks in a breath. A while back, um, 
Uh, about ten months before the start of the school year. Was there a villain attack? Izuka realizes instantly that, of course, there was a villain attack. There's always a villain attack happening. Specifics. A sludge villain made a slime. That's how we met. I remember seeing that on the news. Sensei chimes in hesitantly. He attacked a junior high student, didn't he? There wasn't exactly much detail in the news report, but it did say the victim was a minor. He attacked Bakugokun. Nezu shakes his head. That young man almost died. Hmm, I do remember that. All might hums thoughtfully. It had been a very long day, and my time limit had just started getting shorter. I happened upon... The man freezes, eyes widening. I happened upon a young man being attacked under a bridge. A bridge? Suguchi frowns in confusion. That attack took place downtown. The first attack, Izuku whispers. Yagi-san, what happened during that first attack? He was just a young boy. I managed to catch the villain quite easily. When the boy came to, he wanted an autograph, but like I said, my time limit. I tried to leave to bring the villain into custody, but he... You... You grabbed onto my leg as I took off. I remember you now. You were that boy. Deku was that boy. Izuku swallows. You showed him your injury, Izuku says, knowing the man remembers that too, just by how his face twists in horror. You dropped him off on a rooftop, and you showed him what happened to you. What all for one did to you. He... He asked you a question, and you answered. Yes, the man swallows. I did. Yagi, Suguchi breathes out, wide eyes on his friend. What did you do? He asked me if someone who was corpless could be a hero. Yagi whispers, and I said no. You said no, Sensei repeats stiffly. The number one hero said a corkless middle schooler couldn't be a hero. On a rooftop. Wonderful. Midoriya Izuku committed suicide three days after that attack. Tsukuchi sucks in a breath. Detective Tsukuchi's eyes narrow on Yagi-san, and it's the angriest Izuku thinks he's ever seen the detective. You said you didn't know the kid when I showed you his picture, Yagi. I didn't. The man insists desperately. I didn't even know Midori and Deku were one and the same until now. I wouldn't have known, Tsukuchi. You know I don't watch the news. I couldn't have been the one. I never would have left him if I'd known he was... What did you think would happen leaving a kid like that? Sensei hisses. Damn it, Yagi. Gentlemen, Nezu calms, standing up on the books and pressing his paws on the tabletop. Let's remember that Deku was in fact alive. He did not commit suicide. Midori, what happened after that in your reality? I... Izuku swallows, thinking back. I heard the attack, and when I realized it was Kachan, I... It was stupid, but I tried to help. None of the pros were doing anything, and he's... He's my friend. I threw my backpack, and I tried to get the sludge villain off him. All Might saved us both, and then he found me walking home and... Well, you know. Jacku never showed up at the second attack, Tsukuchi tells the green-haired teen. Bakugo almost died. He was in the hospital for two days due to dry drowning. He fell unconscious in the sludge. But Yagi did arrive in time to help. But Deku never showed up like you're saying. Something else must have happened then, Izuku tells them in frustration. I don't know what, but All Might and I had that same conversation, but things differ after that. Something's different. I don't understand. Problem child. Aizawa Sensei sighs, setting his hand on Izuku's shoulder and giving a gentle squeeze. Deku is not your problem to solve. The reality created him. So it's on us to take care of him. Yes. All Might admits shamefully. Aizawa-san is correct. You should be focused on yourself, my boy. Hopefully you won't have any more problems now that everything here has been sorted out. Listen, young Midoriya, Deku has been our problem long before you arrived here. Don't get caught up in something you can't change. Right, Izuku frowns. And if you need any more help with One for All while you're here, I would be more than happy to assist you in any way I can until you've returned to your own reality. And All Might. Yagi-san offers a kind smile, but... His eyes are still sad and guilty. Izuku bites back a frown. Thank you. Izuku frowns to himself, sitting cross-legged on the bed in the guest room of Aizawa Sensei and Yamada Sensei's apartment. He stares down at the small folded-up square paper. It's crumpled and wilted, no doubt from Izuku's own sweaty hands when he'd gotten it. The paper is familiar to the touch, worn messily out of a notebook. He thinks back to the press of that stranger's hand in his own. The paper wedged between their hands, before the figure started to pull away, but not before ensuring Izuku had a hold of the tiny folded-up paper before doing so. He remembers cold fingers guiding his own into a fist around the well-hidden note that had been pressed into his palm. 
Notebooks of analysis scattered on the ground flash in his mind, writing so familiar it hurt. The brand of notebooks he always uses, the graphite pencils, he likes over the mechanical ones everyone else his age seemed to prefer in the sharp, fluid lines of kanji. The same exact writing that's on the small, crumpled-up paper held in his hands. And on the multiple analysis books of his own back in his dorm room in his own reality. Mizuku shuts his eyes and sees a glimpse of narrowed green eyes and the dark, foresty tips of what he knows to be unruly curls hidden behind the hood. He has little doubts about it now, the more he thinks about it. The more he stares at the note in his hands and replays the interaction in his head, picking minuscule details apart, the more the anxious feeling in his chest settles. Mizuka draws in a stuttery breath, thumbing along the note that looks as if he could have written it himself. It looks like he'd finally met Deku. All right, listeners, this concludes Chapter 9 of When Realities Collide. Chapter 10 will be next. I hope you all are still enjoying this fic, eager to hear your thoughts and reactions, and as always... Thank you so much for listening.